Hello and welcome. This here in my left hand and now in my right hand is an Echo Cornet. It is something that was very kindly sent to me by a man named William from Norway. This here is an instrument that uh, is quite obviously different from your normal sorts of cornets and what makes it different is this sort of growth that we have on its left side. Uh, it has, if we sort of move that growth out of the way, it has a fourth valve in here, a little stumpy, little stumpy fourth valve. And what that does is it diverts the airflow so that instead of the air coming out the main bell, as you would have in a normal cornet, it comes out this secondary bell. What it does, and by doing that, is creates a completely different sound. It sort of sounds a little bit as though you've got Harman mute stuffed in your instrument. And so by having this contraption attached to your instrument, you can easily oscillate your sounds between a normal cornet sound and uh, a cornet sound that sounds like it's got a mute in it. It's a very quick thing to do just by pressing that little valve. Echo cornets have existed for quite a long time but only ever really as a bit of a niche instrument. We have examples that go all the way back to the late 1800s um, but as I said they're only ever really been a niche, a bit of an obscure instrument although in certain contexts particularly useful. This particular example is uh, made by the only company that I know of which makes them still today and that is a company in India. Um, the logo on this which appears to have been etched on lovingly with a chainsaw uh, reads Empire Brass and then there's a picture of a bugle that wouldn't musically function um, and then the word India. So this is an instrument made in India. It's a lot better than my world's cheapest cornet and world's cheapest trumpet videos which featured instruments that had also been made in India but make no mistake this is not an instrument that you would purchase yourself if you wanted an echo cornet. Some of you have noticed that it has sat uh, in this little vacant little posture in, uh, on my wall of many things and it sits there for a good reason. Very visually interesting, musically dubious and um, it's, it's sort of quite challenging as an instrument to play. But nonetheless, despite having a bit of a dubious instrument of, of sort of questionable quality, there are a number of interesting elements that we can have a, a brief look at today. And we'll start with this stumpy fourth valve. So I'll uh, gain some access to it by removing this sort of contraption off the side. And so by removing the uh, echo attachment, we can see this fourth valve here. It's a little stumpy thing, but what makes it particularly interesting is not its size, but the fact that it's sort of in reverse. You can't, with normal valves, you take them out the top, but you can't with this because the rest of the bell is in the way. If I hold it this way, you'll see the sort of alignment issue that we have. So you take the uh, top of the finger button off, you take the top of the valve cap off and the bottom valve cap, and then the, the valve comes out from the bottom. Quite unusual. It's also a bottom sprung valve, whereas the rest of the valves have uh, a top sprung. And what I mean by that is if I use my manly grip to loosen the valve, uh, and take this out, you will see that there is a spring at the top of the valve. When the valve gets pushed down, uh, the spring, which sits on a little washer thing, uh, travels with it, and that gives this, uh, the valve the ability to pop back up again. It's sort of something that you only really see, actually, on cornets and trumpets. Um, nearly every other instrument is uh, bottom sprung and what I mean by bottom sprung is that there is a spring that sits underneath the valve which provides a sort of a boost, an up thrust uh, that pushes the valve back into its normal position. The next thing that makes this valve quite unusual is the fact that the valve guide is in the bottom. The valve guide is not in the top as it would be in every other brass instrument that I've ever seen in my life. It's actually in the bottom here, something that's a little bit interesting. Um, the quality of the craftsmanship on the valve uh, can probably be demonstrated by this picture that I took earlier. We can see the various constructive elements of the uh, valve, but we can also see the fact that the valve guide has been screwed on so far that it's actually popped through the wall of the valve itself. Um, it doesn't have a actual impact on playing it, but it certainly does look rather pants. This instrument suffers from some of the other lack of attention to detail that we see on uh, other inexpensive Indian made instruments, namely the fact that the screw threads for the valve caps appear to have been made by a plough pulled by a couple of dung oxen. 
Um, so you sort of have to sort of bear with that. But as a sort of an example of an echo corner, it works reasonably well, at least visually. One thing that is probably fairly apparent when I play this instrument is that the intonation between the primary bell, which is adequate if not great, is certainly far better than the intonation that you get through the secondary bell, which is woeful. Uh, unfortunately, whilst the low, lower notes in the register are more or less in tune, the higher you go, the sharper the second bell gets. Now you might think that you can uh, just loosen this thread and pull out this bell to make it a little bit flatter, and indeed you can, but only about a few millimetres or so, because if you try to pull this out any more than that, there is a little slit in here and you get, a, uh, you get an opportunity for the air inside the instrument to escape, and that just makes everything worse. So the amount that you can adjust the tuning for the second bell is between there and there, which, I mean this isn't a scientific video of course, but it's not much. It's not much in both metric and imperial measures. Now the instrument, as I mentioned, gives you the ability to change the tone of your sound very rapidly just by pushing this, this fourth valve down. Um, but that's not something that uh, is often called for in musical, musical literature. Uh, mutes do the exact same thing and have existed, as far as my sources can uh, confirm for me, as long as we've had these. So these didn't predate mutes, as far as I can find out. Um, so you sort of wonder why we have two contraptions that can do roughly the same thing. The only argument I can think of for the Echo Cornet is that you can oscillate between the two types of sounds as fast as you can trill, very rapidly oscillating between the two different uh, types of sounds. But in practical musical contexts, it doesn't take very long to put a Cornet mute in and out, um, and it's something you can comfortably fit in your hand. So I don't see the advantage for something like this, unless it was as a novelty. Um, so if anyone out there has a little bit of information or can find some sources of music that calls specifically for this instrument with this sort of contraption, as opposed to something that has, uh, can be achieved by just bringing a mute in and out, I'll be very interested to know because I haven't been able to find very much. So to finish, I just want to reiterate my thanks to William for sending me this lovely instrument. It's going to have a very special place on my wall of many things. I uh, hope the rest of you have enjoyed learning about the Echo Cornet. And uh, also, just to reiterate, don't buy this one.